In January 2006, 24-year-old Florida native Jennifer Cassie vanished on her way to work. Two days later, her Chevy Malibu was found in the parking lot of a neighboring apartment complex about a mile from her home. Security footage showed a man dropping off her car at around noon on the day of her disappearance. But unfortunately, his face was obscured behind the complex's gate. 16 years later, this man remains unidentified, and Jennifer's friends and family are left to wonder what happened. Hello, and welcome to Fact and Suspicion. I'm your host, Ben. And I'm your other host, Dan. And tonight's mystery is the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. So, Ben, who exactly was Jennifer Kessie? So, by all accounts, she was a kind, responsible young woman, and things were going really well for her. She had recently graduated from the University of Central Florida with a degree in finance and was working as a finance manager for a timeshare company. She had just purchased a new condo, and the weekend before her disappearance, she vacationed in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands uh, with her boyfriend, Rob Allen, which I guess brings us to her disappearance. So Jennifer and Rob returned home from St. Croix on Sunday the 22nd. She spent the night at his place in Fort Lauderdale and drove three hours straight to work the next day in Orlando. Jennifer was last seen leaving work at about 6 o'clock that night, but it's not the last time she was heard from. She made two phone calls that evening, uh, one to her father at 6.15 and another to her boyfriend at 10. That's the last known conversation she had before vanishing. Her boyfriend was the first person to suspect something was wrong. Uh, Jennifer had a habit of texting or calling him before work, and when she failed to do so, he became concerned. When Jennifer missed her meeting at work without calling, it was so out of character that her employer contacted her parents, who drove straight to Orlando. That would be a terrible phone call to get. Yeah, I imagine it was, and her parents seemed like lovely people, too. Um, They've done everything in their power to keep this case in the public consciousness. So, they arrived at Jennifer's place at about three, and nothing appeared to be amiss. There were no signs of a struggle, and nothing appeared to have been stolen. They found wet towels in the bathroom, and the vanity appeared to have been used that morning. Her purse and cell phone were gone, and the door was locked, so it appeared as though she had left for work as usual. At this point, her parents called the police, and were frustrated to be told that Jennifer is an adult who likely left of her own volition. So I have one question here. Uh, you said that her her boyfriend was concerned because he, she usually texted him before she went to work? Yes. But it does look like she you know, got ready and left the house like normal, right? Uh, right. I, I think that she usually texted him on the way to work. Okay, okay. That Well, that clarifies that. So with the police sticking to the 24-hour rule for uh, missing adults, her parents and friends took matters into their own hands and began distributing flyers with Jennifer's pictures across the neighborhood. Now, around 5 that evening, the Orlando police decided to get involved. They sent a detective to Jennifer's condo to begin speaking with witnesses, and pretty quickly they discovered something very disturbing. A couple who lived in Jennifer's complex said they had seen her vehicle swerving out of the complex that morning, and it appeared as though two people were fighting over the wheel. Wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty disturbing, right? Right, yeah. But you, it would be nice if the police had found that out a little bit earlier. I mean, had they gotten involved earlier, I'm sure they would have. Now, unfortunately, the couple couldn't be sure which direction the car went when it exited the complex. So from here, the trail kind of goes cold. At least until two days later, when Jennifer's Chevy Malibu was discovered at a nearby condominium complex, Huntingdon on the Green. A tenant had recognized her vehicle from the news. Now, this was troubling for investigators because this wasn't an area that Jennifer was known to frequent, and because it was an area where stolen vehicles were frequently recovered. So, not a good part of town. 
Uh, so you mentioned that the person that returned the car was actually caught on security footage, right? Yes. So investigators checked with the condo to see if they had security footage, and of course they did. And what they found, again, was pretty disturbing. The footage shows an unidentified, probably male, parked Jennifer's car near the pool area of the complex. The man sits in the car for about 30 seconds and then gets out and walks away. Another camera caught the man leaving the complex on foot, headed in the direction of Jennifer's complex. But unfortunately, it only took a photo every three seconds. And as it happens, in each frame captured, the man's face was obscured behind a different fence post. This led journalists to call him the luckiest person of interest in history. Now, was there, were there not more cameras going down the street that could have caught him? If there were, we don't have that information, but it doesn't appear so, no. That, that guy does seem lucky. Yeah, no question. And very unfortunate for uh, Jennifer's family and investigators. No question. Well, it, his face was obscured. Were there any other distinguishing traits? Did he have a limp or missing leg or something? Well, no limp or peg leg, but they were able to glean some information. They were able to determine the man's height to be between 5'3 and 5'5. Five five. They even contacted NASA to enhance the footage, uh, but unfortunately it didn't help them identify the man. Now, the 5'3 five to 5'5 five five estimate is probably pretty convincing because they actually had people walk past the gate and then uh, compared the two. So the measurement is probably fairly accurate. But his height was all they were able to get from that? Just about. There is one more piece of information that's possible, but, but we'll get to that in a bit because it's not really relevant just yet. Now, when police examined Jennifer's vehicle, they saw no signs of a struggle, which seems to conflict with the couple's story about fighting for control of the car. But, I mean, what exactly would that look like? Right. I, I don't know what you would expect to see other than, you know, maybe if there was something in the car that had been spilled, but obviously he could have cleaned that up when he turned, brought it back or maybe like the interior was scuffed or something like that. But I, I really don't know how you would determine a struggle that was in a car. Right. That, that's my thoughts. Exactly. I, I don't think the one contradicts the other in this case. So inside of the vehicle, investigators found her cell phone, charger, a DVD player, sandals, and shoes. So it didn't appear to be a robbery. And while they never found her purse, her bank card was never used, so it doesn't seem as though money was the primary motive either. Uh, were they able to pull any prints from the car or get anyone else's DNA? Unfortunately, no. Uh, neither of the two. In fact, there is no physical evidence in this case at all. I can't imagine that the guy didn't at least, you know, like, leave some hair follicles or something. Um, it's a good point. Now, he may have left uh, fingerprints and then wiped them off, because remember, he was in the vehicle for about 30 seconds before getting out. Right, or he could have just, you know, worn gloves to deliver the car. I don't exactly. Know. Now, one particularly troubling detail involves pictures taken of the vehicle's hood. As Jennifer's father points out, the dust on the hood appears to show the silhouette of a person's upper body. It looks as though Jennifer was forced uh, face down onto the car's hood at some point during her abduction. That is strange, though, if he if if the abductor had forced her down like that, because if he had, you know, tied her up there, I don't see how she would have been able to fight with him for the steering wheel. I doubt that means that he tied her up. I think that was just more indicative of an initial uh, violent altercation, right? Maybe he snuck up behind her, forced her down, and then forced her into the vehicle. That, that does make sense. So at this point, a police dog was brought in and was able to trace a scent from the car back to Jennifer's condo, leading investigators to believe that the suspect returned to the site of the abduction. And there may be a good reason for this that we'll get to in just a bit. So was there any kind of security footage maybe outside of her door or something like that they could have traced, traced him to? Again, unfortunately, no. They were doing renovations at the place, which we're going to discuss a little later, 
Uh, and if they did have security footage, that may uh, be a reason why there wasn't any at the time. Though I, that's just speculation. I, I can't be certain. It really seems like this guy was just magically able to elude any kind of cameras. Yeah, his, his luck was just incredible. I mean, he was caught on that incredibly grainy footage pulling in to the other apartment complex where he parked the car and then to be obscured behind the posts like that. I mean, what are the odds? I, I can't imagine. Uh, so the police find anything else interesting? No. And that's part of the problem with the case. There's just so little evidence. But we do have some suspects. So to begin with, there's the boyfriend, Rob Allen simply because police always look closely at the significant other. You know how it works. Right, right. And he was the last one to speak with her as well, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Now, the police actually brought Rob to the scene while they were processing the vehicle. They claimed that they wanted his opinion about whether anything appeared off inside the vehicle, but it seems more likely that they really wanted to gauge his reaction when they opened the trunk in case they found Jennifer's body inside. Now, it's true that Rob and Jennifer had a bit of a fight over the phone the night before her disappearance, but it doesn't appear to have been anything serious. Rob said it was just strain from a long-distance relationship, which honestly seems pretty normal. She lived in Orlando. He lived in Fort Lauderdale. They had just had a nice vacation, and I'm sure she missed him, right? Yeah, exactly. Also, I couldn't imagine him hurting her just after they get back from vacation out of there. It seems strange. Right. Their relationship seemed like it was largely in a good place. And what problems they had seemed to be because they weren't together more often, which seems like a decent problem to have as far as relationship troubles go. Better than some other cases we've looked at. Right. Now, Rob was pretty quickly ruled out as a suspect for the simple reason that he was 200 miles away at the time of Jennifer's disappearance. So, it almost certainly could not have been him. Next, there's Jennifer's ex-boyfriend, Matt, who was seen drinking at a bar across from Jennifer's condominium complex the night before her disappearance. Matt told police that he was jealous of Jennifer's new relationship and was upset about her vacation with Rob, but he volunteered to take a polygraph examination and police didn't think there was enough evidence to even bother with it. So he was not a very likely suspect. Did he fit the, uh, the physical profile, though, of what they had on camera? I searched for that information and could not find it. Uh, maybe he didn't match, and that's why they didn't pursue it. I- I'm sure that had something to do with it, because I-, I have to imagine that any suspects they were looking at, they were comparing strongly to that footage. Right. Now, a more interesting suspect is a co-worker of Jennifer's named Johnny Campos. Johnny had apparently made multiple unsuccessful passes at Jennifer, and according to Jennifer's father, Drew, Jennifer had complained to him several times about Johnny's behavior. Jennifer had a strict policy against dating co-workers, but Johnny just wasn't getting the message. And interestingly enough, Johnny arrived late to work on the 24th and his co-workers said he was visibly anxious. Well, did he have an, an excuse for being late? Does he have an alibi? Well, he claims it was due to a traffic ticket, which seems like it would be easy enough to check, but apparently it's never been verified. I don't know if that's whether police didn't take him seriously enough to even look into it, which honestly seems pretty sloppy, especially considering what I'm about to tell you, but I, I really don't know why it hasn't been verified. That's really strange. Yeah, it is. Now, another co-worker, Adam, claimed that Johnny was angry about Jennifer's new relationship. According to Adam, Johnny told Jennifer that he was upset about her vacation with Rob on the 23rd, which was the day she returned from her trip and the day before her disappearance. I've got to be honest. It seems a bit creepy to me that he would even give her an opinion about how he felt about her relationship when the two of them aren't together. They have no relationship. Yeah, I thought the exact same thing. I mean, who does that? Even if you were upset about it, I can't imagine actually saying that out loud, right? Right. It's it's way too forward. But honestly, he gets even creepier. 
Oh, let's hear let's hear some more. So Adam told two other interesting stories about Johnny. Apparently, a few weeks earlier, Adam had casually complimented Jennifer on her appearance, and hearing this, Johnny demanded to know if he was sexually interested in Jennifer. Oh, that's that's creepy and gross. Right, I mean, that, that's crossing so many lines, I don't even know where to begin. And even stranger, the day after Jennifer's disappearance, Johnny told Adam that Jennifer was, quote, likely eaten up by alligators already. Ooh. Real weirdo, huh? Yeah, like like he's saying that he knows where her body is? That's one interpretation, I suppose, or maybe giving him the benefit of the doubt, he was just speculating in a very crude manner. Either way, that's not normal. Not at all. And I can't imagine saying that about someone that you had such a crush on, right? Seems like you'd be devastated. Well, he seemed like he might have had some anger issues. So maybe in his mind, if she wasn't with him, better off that way, right? It seems to me that a lot of people we see in these cases have that same pattern of thought. A very unhealthy pattern of thought. But again, as with the other suspects, there is no physical evidence linking him to her disappearance, and he was never even named a person of interest, to my knowledge. So that's really strange to me with, you know, with at least that circumstantial evidence, right? No, he definitely seems a bit unhinged. I mean, at a bare minimum, his behavior was entirely inappropriate for a workplace. So if the police never seemed interested in him as a suspect, did did they have someone else in mind? So to my knowledge, no one in particular, but the next theory is probably the one taken the most seriously by police. And that was the possibility that a construction worker at Jennifer's condo was somehow involved. And there's pretty good reason for this. Uh, Jennifer's condo was doing major renovations at the time of her disappearance. And she told her family on numerous occasions that the workers made her extremely uncomfortable. They would stop working and stare when she would walk by, catcall her, and generally behave inappropriately. They made Jennifer so anxious that any time they had to do work inside of her unit, she would remain on the phone with friends and family until they left. And Jennifer wasn't the only person who complained about the workers. Numerous women who lived in her complex had very similar stories. And bizarrely, these workers, many of whom had keys to every unit in the complex, were allowed to stay in unused condos while they were working. Up to 10 people are believed to have been staying in a unit very close to Jennifer's at the time of her disappearance. I've never heard of of construction workers being able to do that before. You know, to stay in the building they're working on? It is extremely strange. They had strangers with no leasing agreement who didn't go through any sort of background check staying in their complex. And considering, again, that many of them had keys to every unit in the building, I mean, that had to be concerning for many of the people who had actually gone through the application process. Yeah, very concerning. You know, on top of the fact that they're, you know, catcalling all these women and stuff like that. Right. I hate to say it too, and that is you know commonplace for construction workers. It doesn't mean it's right. Common stereotype, right? You know, it doesn't mean it's right. It's you know you should never treat women like that and make them feel uncomfortable. But this seems to go even beyond that, though. Yeah, that does seem to be the case. Uh, If for no other reason, just the sheer number of women who complained, and some of their stories were particularly strange. One woman claims that she caught one of the workers. Let's say pleasuring himself outside of her condo oh so i think i think the women in this complex had every reason to be concerned by their behavior that is just terrible i'm surprised that the complex didn't change the construction company well it seems that a lot of these workers were illegals so who knows what kind of discount they were getting no that's true Now, the worker theory would also explain why the police dog tracked the scent from the car back to a bush at Jennifer's condo. Whoever it was could have simply walked back to work after murdering Jennifer. Adding to this is the footage of the mystery suspect. 
It looks very much like the person in question is wearing coveralls, attire common to construction and maintenance workers. A Reddit user, Ari Alexa, adjusted the luminosity on the surveillance shots and the outline of the suspect's clothing strongly resembles coveralls. I mean, it's really convincing. Right, but I would say that wearing coveralls, I mean, that's hardly a smoking gun. Oh, of course not. But it is one piece of evidence that might suggest a worker. And, you know, added to the fact uh, that the dog tracked the scent back to her complex and the footage they have of the suspect walking back in that direction. Right. Now, unfortunately, many of the workers left before police could speak with them. Like I said, uh, many of them were in the country illegally and naturally were afraid to speak with police. And despite the fact that so many of them were living at the condo complex, police couldn't use lease records to track them because, well, they didn't have leases. You know, honestly, I would, I feel like, you know, Jennifer's family should have been able to sue the apartment complex over this. I thought the exact same thing. I guess they were just more concerned about finding their daughter than, you know, a lawsuit. But it certainly seemed like they had one on their hands. I have mixed feelings about lawsuits in these sort of cases. A lot of people feel like, you know, they seem like they're selling out their loved one. But I feel like in these sort of cases, when a company or the department complex in this case does something that could put uh, people in danger, You really have to do something to punish them for that, right? You know, to to make an example so other people won't do that in the future. Oh, I agree. Lawsuits like this can act as a strong deterrent for people later on. Exactly. Now, the last suspect is in the same vein. He's a particular maintenance worker who went by the nickname Chino. So, three years after Jennifer's disappearance, Detective Joel Wright decided to take a fresh look at the case, and he found a housekeeper who had never been questioned back in 2006. And when he showed her the surveillance footage, she said the walk in clothing looked like a man she knew as Chino. And it turns out that this man used to live in another building at Jennifer's condo complex and was a former maintenance worker there. He had even done work inside of Jennifer's unit as recently as a week before her disappearance. You know, if he was in her actual unit, he was. that sets off alarms for me because, you know, sometimes people will maybe see pictures of someone and get sort of an unhealthy attachment to them like that. I mean, we saw the same thing in the Daniel LaPlante case, right? Right. Now, to be fair to Chino, he wasn't the only person who, you know, went into her unit. You know, it was part of his job. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And I don't want to make assumptions because, you know, he didn't break in there. He went in for his own job. But, you know, this is seems like pretty heavy circumstantial evidence here. Yeah, and honestly, it only gets worse for Chino. So, naturally, Wright went looking for Chino. And it turns out that he wasn't a hard man to find because he was currently serving time in a Florida prison for the sexual battery of a minor in 2008, just two years after Jennifer vanished. That... It's yeah, troubling, that's, yes. That's troubling. That's setting off all kinds of alarms for me. No question. So, Wright set up an interview with Chino at the prison, and Chino denied any involvement in the crime. And to be fair to him, Wright described him as very cooperative, and apparently he even agreed to take a polygraph examination, which he passed for whatever that's worth. And there's also the matter of his height. You know, you asked earlier if one of the other suspects, if we knew their height, and I didn't have an answer there. But in this case, we do know. Chino is 5'9", four inches taller than the upper estimate of the person in the footage. Now, that doesn't conclusively rule him out, of course, but I think it is decent evidence that it probably wasn't him. But we do have to keep in mind that was just an estimate from the footage. Right, but it was a pretty educated estimate. Because, uh, again, they actually had people walk past the fence whose height they knew and then compared that to the person in the footage. So they had a pretty good relative comparison. So if it's probably not Chino because of his height, 
Do we have any suspects that fit better? Unfortunately, no. I would say of all the suspects, Chino is the most convincing. But it really depends on how much you consider the height estimate uh, by the police to be conclusive in this issue, right? You still have to keep in mind it could have been another construction worker. Right, and that's a very real possibility. That's why I discussed the other construction workers in general before talking about Chino in particular. I mean, unfortunately, there's simply no physical evidence in Jennifer's case. You know, as I said earlier, there are several people who certainly seem suspicious, but ultimately it's it's all circumstantial. It really is. And something that's strange to me, this was in 2006, you said, right? Yes. Well, in 2006, it seems impossible not to leave a hair follicle or some kind of DNA evidence in that car. I feel like whoever did this to Jennifer had to have known what they were doing. Seems like they've done this before, wouldn't you think? That's certainly a possibility, because it it does seem like maybe they wiped the vehicle down. But of course, it could just be as simple as the suspect wore gloves. Well, it could be, but were they also wearing a hairnet? I take your point, though I should probably also point out that even if he had left hair, research has shown hair analysis to be of pretty limited forensic value. Maybe he really knew what he was doing, or maybe he was just really lucky. Well, I think luck is unquestionable. I mean, given the surveillance footage and his face being obscured in every frame, what are the odds? Now, whether he knew what he was doing or not, it's hard to say. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he planned the security footage. I mean, obviously, this guy's not James Bond. Right. That was luck. I just mean the fact that there was no DNA evidence whatsoever. Like, let's say there was there was a scuffle. You know, there's no no blood. There's no uh, hair follicles, no fingerprints, nothing. Right. Uh, it's that, a good point. He certainly could have been. Uh, you know, this may not have been his first crime. Right. You know, and we keep saying he. Honestly, we can't even be 100% sure it was a man. I mean, I'm reasonably convinced it was, but even that's something we can't be certain of, which is just another another reason this case is so infuriating. Yeah, I would love to have more information maybe about some of the individuals that were staying in the apartment complex, if any of the rest of them had records. That would be absolutely wonderful. But again, unfortunately, because so many of them were were there illegally, they didn't have leases, so there's no way to track them. That's just It's just infuriating that, you know, I'm sure the police have been pulling their hair out about that for a long time. Yeah, I, I imagine that they did. And I say did because, as we're going to learn here in just a moment, the case of Jennifer Cassie is no longer being officially investigated by any police department. Wait, I mean, I didn't think it was solved. Did they, did they solve it? It isn't solved. So one of the things that sets this case apart from just about any other we've looked at is that there is currently no active police investigation into Jennifer Cassie's disappearance. In 2018, Jennifer's family, unsatisfied with the police investigation and frustrated by the lack of information they were receiving, sued the Orlando Police Department to obtain their case files. A year later, the department agreed to settle and handed over more than 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of video and audio to the family. Now, as part of the agreement, the Orlando police have officially closed their investigation into Jennifer's disappearance. The investigation is now entirely in the hands of the Cassie family and their private investigator, Michael Toretta. So they sued for the information. They wanted the police files themselves because they didn't think that The police were taking it seriously enough. And when the new chief of police, whose name I don't remember offhand, took over, he decided to settle and gave them the case files. But again, as part of that agreement, the case is closed. If and when they discover more information, they can turn it over to the proper authorities. Did the family request that they close the case? Yes. Uh, I've never heard of anything like this either. But the family, just they wanted the case files. And they didn't care if they were going to be the only ones working on it. They figured they'd take it more seriously than the police were. Well, I mean, I suppose if, you know, they're financially able to do so and can pay a private investigator to work on this, you know, consistently, 
it'll probably get more attention that way. More attention, yes. Though I have to wonder if the lack of police authority could hinder the investigation more than help it. But I'm sure the Cassie's considered that. Right, a, a PI just won't have the same resources. Exactly. So, the last meaningful movement in Jennifer's case occurred in 2019. The Cassie family received a tip that 10 months after Jennifer's disappearance, a person was seen dumping a rolled up piece of carpet into Lake Fisher near Jennifer's place. And that's interesting because the day laborers were putting down carpet when Jennifer disappeared. Toretta shared this tip with the authorities, and it was taken seriously enough that police divers spent several days scouring the lake for Jennifer's remains. Now, the police claim nothing was found, but Toretta maintains that the search resulted in, quote, an interesting lead, whatever that means. So it's hard to say one way or the other. We're getting conflicting information. I wonder if it means they found, you know, some carpet, but there weren't enough remains left. That's a good question. I hadn't actually considered that. I, I'm, I guess it's possible. But again, uh, something I neglected to mention, as part of the agreement, the Cassies can't actually share the information they got from the police, except for with their private investigator. So even if they did know something, I doubt they could make it public. That makes sense, though, because, you know, you, you don't want certain details getting out. The really strange thing to me about that is 10 months. That's a long time to keep a body. Yeah, I thought the same thing, man. By that point, the decomposition would have to be horrible. Would it even finish decomposing by the end? I, I don't know how long it takes. I, I think it depends on the, the circumstances. What, what I was thinking is if you're going to keep it for 10 months, wouldn't you have to do something to preserve it, like put it in a deep freeze or something like that? And I don't feel like you know a construction worker that's you know living in a, an empty condo would have access to that i mean where would they hide the body for 10 months it's a really good question i thought maybe they had buried it somewhere and then later dug it back up and decided to ditch it you know if indeed the whole carpet thing had anything to do with cassie right uh, maybe and you know we, we can't say that it does though i don't know you, you hear of people digging bodies back up and trying to dispose of them again but I cannot imagine ever doing that myself. No, I mean, I can't imagine killing anyone to begin with. But if I did, it's hard to imagine me coming back 10 months later, digging it up and trying to do something else with it. Like, that just seems like a good way to get caught. Right. But regardless, it's it's very interesting, you know, that point. And just the fact that the private investigator said that, you know, there was a lead because of that. It, it makes me think that, you know, they they think that that was Jennifer's body being dumped 10 months later. Yeah, that's a possibility. Though, you know, again, it was a tip from a woman who said she saw something strange being dumped into a river 10 months after Jennifer's disappearance. So, you know, it may not have had anything to do with her case at all. That's true. A lot of people dump stuff into rivers. It's not, it's, it doesn't mean it's a body. It's unfortunate, but yeah, it's true. So that was the end, pretty much? Nothing else of note after that? Yeah, like I said, that's the last, you know, significant movement in her case. There, there's really been nothing since. Do you have any other questions or anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's about it. What, what do you think happened, though? That's a good question. I mean, it's almost impossible to say. I think the most plausible theory is that it was one of the maintenance workers at Jennifer's condo. It would explain why the dog traced a scent back to the complex and why the suspect appears to be wearing coveralls in the surveillance footage. You know, several of these workers made Jennifer, as well as other women, extremely uncomfortable. So it doesn't seem like a stretch that one of them could have gone a step further and, you know, actually harmed someone. Uh, the evidence suggests that Jennifer was likely abducted from her complex, and that also seems to fit a worker. So that's my best guess, though, again, that there's just no way to be certain. I hate cases with so much uncertainty in them. I mean, of the of the options I've laid out, I mean, which do you think is the most likely? I would have to agree. I'd, I'd say it's it's most likely one of the workers there. I, I can't say necessarily I think that it was Chino, but... Right, I, I certainly wouldn't be comfortable naming anyone in particular. Though I will say that as far as like the creepiness factor goes, Johnny Campos is a close second. That's true. 
I feel like the police should have at least looked into him a bit more because of the things he said. You know, I, I, I can't really comment on how much they uh, investigated Campos because, you know, you know how hard it is finding information on, on the, some of these cases, particularly on what police knew about any given suspect. It's always difficult. Yeah, e- exactly. And, you know, he could have had an airtight alibi for all we know. Right. Well, I suppose we'll cut it there then, buddy. Thank you for listening to Fact and Suspicion. If you have any information about the disappearance of Jennifer Cassie, please contact the Cassie family tip line. You can find the number at jennifercassie.com, along with a link to the family's GoFundMe, if you want to contribute to bringing Jennifer home.